not something feasible. There are too many technical details that would not allow you to actually get that data. But having even a minimal information is already better than an Excel sheet attached to a document. So being enabling these technologies to be able to give us more than what is only written in the article is something that I'm strongly advocating for. And I've been more interested, much more in the recent time, because of the, the thing I'll discuss today in much more details, into the modeling capabilities of how can we model biological system in a dynamical manner. What I'll try to give you is, a, is an overview of this. The first question to ask, is that guy in front of you completely crazy to try to model biology? because we don't know a lot about it. And I took um, a slide from actually Marvin Kassman, who is going around and talking about systems biology. And I liked really that example where basically the first thing was he put out or pulled out the notes that was in the New York Times on the 9th of October 1903, where the journalist was writing that the flying machine will, re will really fly and might be evolved by the combined and continuous effort of mathematicians and mechanicians in one to a or 10 million years, which is actually good kind of a, an extent. But on the same day, Orville Wright wrote on his uh, diary that he started building the machine. So yes, it certainly is completely crazy to try to model biology, but I don't think it's not the time to try to do that. And as being working in a pharmaceutical company, one of our research is really to try to understand how we can change the different cell type that exist in the immune cells. For example, I'll talk about this today in the T helper cell, but also in the B cell uh, compartment. Trying to model this kind of cell type is actually very important, but we need to model that at the molecular level and hopefully go to the organism level. And I'll try to give you a glimpse of how we try to tackle that problem. In the T helper cells, CD4 T cells for the non immunologists in this audience are cells that actually somehow differentiate into two cell types. And there are different molecules that are taking place at this level. Molecules that will dictate whether they're going to produce certain type of cytokines or others. And namely, they are called, and I will call it during the whole talk, TH0 for precursor or naive, undetermined cells, to the TH1 producing interferon gamma or the TH2 producing IL4. So this kind of differentiation is one of the processes that we are interested in because most of the disease that we are working in is actually an imbalance between each of these two types, either too much Th1 or Th2. Knowing molecularly how we can interfere with that, either with drugs or resident studies, is actually a very good plus for our technology. The objective really is to create a network model of molecular mechanism that leads to the differentiation of precursor, that means Th0 cells, into effector cells, Th1 and Th2, and analyze it that through a dynamical process and properties. There have been a lot of reviews and a lot of papers describing how molecularly the T helper differentiation works. And Ken Murphy and Larry Glemscher back in 2000 were trying to infer which were the cytokines required, which were the receptor required, etc., etc. And there have been a lot of people also trying to model the system, but most of these attempts were on a few particular nodes, on a few particular genes, on a few particular cases. And in this case, Hofer actually back in 2002 used an ODE system with a, a parameter fitting to actually model the ATA3 mRNA presence. Yates et al., much later, actually trying to use stochastic modeling, and in this case was only looking at two nodes, which are actually two transcription factors, such as TVET and ATA3. That was for us not really sufficient because we wanted to have much more nodes, but we don't have that much data, which is always the major issue. So what I'll present here today is actually what Luis Mendoza, who is a former postdoc in my group, is now back in UNAM in Mexico, has been working. And the first part of probably like two years' work was to infer from the literature, which is actually painful, to infer the connectivity going from the literature and saying what are the type of relation that exists between any of these cytokine receptor transcription factor from a dynamic effect. Is it inhibitory? Is it activator? Et cetera, et cetera. That's great. At the end of the day, we got that model back four years ago, almost three, years, three and a half years ago, which is a very simple, yet a little bit more complicated than the one I presented before. 
where basically each of these nodes represents either a cytokine receptor transcription factor or some kind of suppressor. So basically all these nodes are represented here and each of these edges are either inhibitory, that would be denoted by red dots, or activator with a with a green analysis. There are a lot of apps of aspects that are important. The first one is really that the network is complete is incomplete. Well that's actually something we know, that's for sure. The second aspect is the network represents really function. So it's the function of what is IL-4 doing to the system that is encoded within this. So that means what is the flow of information that is carried out by this molecule. The molecular mechanism is not really taken into account. It's not like it's going to have a conformational change in order to do the performance control. We'll consider that it's just this transfer of information that is necessary. And this interaction are not directly direct and basically, in this case, that means you might actually miss some intermediary step, as long as the first and the last one are actually in a loop, activating one another is sufficient for the mother. As a first approach, actually, we consider a discrete element at least in two to three states. That means we needed to code that in the first state. The approach we used was to take an approach that has been developed by René Thomas back in 91, which is called the generalized logical analysis. And what it is is actually a qualitative analysis of the dynamical behavior of a network, which permits to identify all the steady states of the system. It's really trying to focus on the presence of positive and negative feedback loops. So if you have a cascading system, a cascading signaling event that ends up with apoptose, cell cycle, it's no use to actually approach that with the general logical analysis. And why do you want to do that? Because Identifying positive feedback loops is actually a way to identify differentiation process. You can differentiate with positive feedback loop between two or several states. The negative feedback loops, on the contrary, actually induce oscillatory or actually homeostasis, and in this case, it's also quite important. Yet they are probably the most difficult to identify. And the final state is that when we do an experiment, when we do an experiment, we are always looking at the state of states. This kind of methodology is actually working well for this. And the definition of a feedback loop can be as simple as a self-loop, either a positive or a negative, or an intricated positive and negative feedback loop, which has a net result would be either positive or negative. So is that just a self-loop? The dynamical properties actually has also some important aspects that in between a positive feedback loop, any state that would be along this line would be only going to either everything inactive or everything active. The negative feedback loop was actually worse. And in a negative and a positive feedback loop, this would actually cycle, and there would be actually the center of uh, the steady state. So when we go to the, to the network, and this is why I have 94 slides, is because I have quite a lot that actually shows all the feedback loops that exist within that network. Got all of them? Okay. So the TH network contains, at, in that model, about 22, not about, Exactly, 22 feedback loops, 19 positive and 3 negative. And the first question is this, are they functional? And there are several ways to test for that. The first way is to do a deductive approach. And what are the set of parameters that give the functionality to all these loops? Well, they are what is called inductive. You set, give a set of parameters, and you look at what is the dynamical behavior of the system. Just before going to a bit more math, don't worry, I won't do that much math. The node can take actually three states, either a low state, an intermediate, or a high state. And if we write that, we take, and I took just the networks, round the interferon gamma. What is influencing interferon gamma? So we got TBET, a transcription factor, that for also in our IRAC, which is actually an intermediate signal. So basically, all these actually influence the level of interferon gamma. And you write that so that you have what would be the state of interferon gamma given IRAC and TBET being at the mean, then that transition we would say that's the level of it from the other with the mean. So you write that all from the topology, write all these dynamical rules. The second aspect is you do what is called a transition rule. And a transition rule is basically taking all the network that you write down and do a truth table. Basically, what would be the level of gata 3 in an increment of one step further within the, the model? If Stat 6 is at 0 and Tibet is at 0, that would be 0. If stat 6 is at 1, then it would be 0. So basically, it depends on the way you write your dynamic. 
And that is only inferred from the topology of the network. That is the only source of information that is at that stage. The second thing is you run the, the algorithm. And out of the two to the power of the number of nodes that you have here, there are only three states that are steady states. The first one is everything inactive. Well, we consider that to be TH0, although I'm not really absolutely sure of this from a large point. The other one, where all the system goes to, is actually a TH2, which is IL4 being active, so that part will be active. The other one is just an attenuation of a signal over interferon gamma, and that would be those four nodes. So remember, we span for all values, and those are the only three steady states that we have. And it's just an attenuation of the level of interferon gamma. The second thing is now that we could do that from, and this, this was about one and a half years I think of work for Lewis, is now that we could do knockout and, and other expression. So you can ask from that network topology, what happens if I knock down one of these transcription factors? What happens if I overexpress another gene? In this case, interferon beta, because one of the drugs is actually treating MS that's actually interferon beta. And this is not something that you need to read, but basically any mutant that would knock down IL-12, IL-18, interferon beta, and 12 receptor, interferon beta receptor, etc., will end up with the same four steady state as I described before. There are other knockouts for which some have never been generated, but generate actually other phenotypes. Those are actually either to be tested with a knockout experiment. Actually, a way to actually understand some of the create integration of the signal, which leads to a clear communication differentiation. What I take as an example now is basically the the interferon gamma, and the interferon gamma has been quite a puzzle for most of the immunologists. At least when I was a PhD immunologist, that was a real puzzle to me. The interferon gamma knockout did not produce interferon gamma. Well, that's good. This is really an interferon gamma knockout. Now, the gamma receptor knockout was actually still producing interferon gamma. And a lot of people were talking about compensatory effects and all type of things that would happen actually to release that interferon gamma into the media of these knockout mice. If you look from a classical point of view, when you knock down that receptor, you would knock down the whole network. Actually, what it turns out is that you don't knock down the whole system. You still have a self loop, a self feeding loop on the Tibet molecule actually still produce interferon gamma. And a lot of people would say, well, argue, since you know that T-belt has a self-regulatory loop, then of course you will see that interferon gamma would be there. The interesting thing is that we did an experiment where we put self-loop on each and every of the nodes that we had in our network, and the only one that you could explain the interferon gamma is actually the T-belt self-loop. We went around then and said, okay, but all right, our system is really nice, our model is really nice, but what would be the people before us predicting? And would there be already, from a dynamical point of view, things that we could predict to be TH1 and TH2 differentiation? And by looking through the literature, none of these models actually turned out to either predict TH1 or TH2. And the thing is that if you look at this model compared to the one that we had before, it has way less negative feedback loops. That's actually one of the key, re key aspects that you need to have in your models. So the pros is that there is enough information to model the T alpha differentiation. We can actually look at the steady states of the whole system. We can start to do knockout and overexpression. And this feedback loop is a way to really qualitatively understand how the system works. The problem is that most of the time you are dealing with quantitative data. And that's why we did the step towards actually trying to have a semi quantitative analysis. But the problem is that there is not enough available quantitative data to do modeling. And when you did, when you have to do parameter uh, fitting or parameter optimization for your ODE, you always fall flat because you don't have the data to refit your models. So we, so we thought rather than doing this, why don't we try to pull a single equation that would actually allow you to give us enough flexibility and the most the, the people in non-biology uh, call that the S-curve, the biology curve, which is a sigmoid, which is actually most of what you have in biological process are of sigmoid structure. And basically trying to write that down into a nice equation, which I won't go too much into the detail, but it's fairly easy. It's got a decay rate 
plus an activation code called a new plus a TK, and you know the TK rate of the molecules. And basically, you, you can tweak the steepness of the curve by just changing one of the parameters, TPH, and you can actually switch actually the, the amplitude of the signal that comes out of one of the nodes, depending whether you have activator or activator. So with all that, we somehow shoot in our own foot, because the continuous system, it's a nonlinear, and such systems are really hard to analyze, and have sometimes no solution, no actual solution, have complex dynamics, including chaos. And the steady state are really hard to find. Normally, it's done through numerical methods, such as uh, initial point of identification. Convergence is always a favorite problem. And I put up the, the Rustler attractor, just because also it's a really nice uh, attractor. And you would bet where do you start with which parameter to actually start the system. But the advantage we had with general logical analysis is that it is, despite being nonlinear, it has simple dynamics. It's finds all steady states of the system. And we can use the GLA method to really find absolutely all the steady states of the system. So the methodology is very simple. It's to take our network, find the steady states, derive the ODEs from that network at the same time, and feed the ODEs with the steady states and let the system run, and see how much it is stable to a perturbation. Well, the, that actually doesn't look that the TL to a sales model that I had actually an extension. We tend to add more and more nodes, and we are now at a, at a much larger network. But that's actually because we continue to add molecules whenever people say, oh, I don't have my pet proteins in there. You add it. If you start with a TH0 from the general logical analysis, you could go from zero, you actually can put a little bit of signal in there, it stays to zero. So that's not, that's just the truth. The TH1, that's the same. There is an attuation of the signal, but that's for the TH2, same thing. Now, what's starting to be quite interesting is that we could randomly choose any values of the system and let the system run in continuous or in a discrete system. And most of the time, on 50,000 randomly chosen, 60% of the time you end up with a TH0 cell, and 51% of the time you end up with a TH1 cell, and in about 33% you end up with a TH2 cell. So that's actually showing that we could use continuous and uh, general logical analysis. So basically, you can use both of the two words, the ODE side and the Boolean side. The good thing then is that you can start to perturb your system by adding cytokines. For example, in this case, adding very little amount, so it goes only to 0 0.1, very little amount of interferon gamma, and the system goes down to, to, to normality. The same as for IL4. Now, when you add much larger amount of interferon gamma, then you switch the system to go to a TH1. And you can come up back again with the IL4, which would be one of the determining factors to actually shift the system towards the other side, and you still have a TH1. For the TH2, it's a little bit more different, but it's still a TH2. There is a transitory effect here, which we haven't understood exactly. And it's, there are people actually doing the experiment to actually show that transitor, and it's actually much more a thing than I thought in the, in the early time. The good thing also is that you can also do the overexpression and look at what happens when you overexpress one gene. In this case, it is the TBET transcription factor. This has been experimentally done that when you do a TBET uh, transgene, you actually revert or shift the whole phenotype of the cells to a TH2 cell, a TH1 cell. cell. So from a TH0, when you have a level of a TBET being completely present, then the whole thing shifts to a TH1. When you start from a TH1, adding or not TBET would not make that much of a difference. When you go to a TH2 cells, adding TBET just reverts the phenotype. and goes up to actually a TH1. This is actually a good way to actually look at the system. Now, I skipped one slide, which was actually the first time that we applied that to, because that was very much theoretical, but when we applied that to some of our therapeutic proteins, for which people were coming and saying, I'm referring that some of this protein has an inhibitory effect on one or two of your nodes that you have in your network. Can you predict what could be the outcome? This is where we are currently. The last three minutes and a half that I have here will be dedicated to the extension of the model. The first one is 
what happens, because all I talked about is an archetypic cells. And these archetypic cells is in isolation, not with each other, not in a gradient, nothing in, in the culture dish. What we did here was actually to take a thousand cells, was to take a thousand cells, randomly uh, assign values to it, put a container with all the cytokines, and start the system run over a period of time, and then extract the cells and see how they look. And this is actually what it gets at the end of the day. On the y-axis, you get each of the nodes, and depending be between green and red, the, the much greener they are, the more close to zero they are. The more red they are, the more close to one they are. And surprising to ourselves, and it was really surprising to us, that we actually find, did find the TH2, did find the TH1, did find a very small amount of TH0, but we were finding two novel states, which was not seen in an archetypic sense. And we were actually thinking that this is like one either intermediary and transitory phase that goes on to the way either a TH1 or TH2. We have to probably investigate that further. The last piece of data I'd like to show you here is when we do that for a cell or several cells in a culture, for the industry, we are actually interested to actually model a larger organism. And mainly, this is the mouse system. In this case, it's the delay type hypersensitivity. And each of these cells, and sometimes it's a mixture of cytokines, growth factors, and cell type. Behind each of the cell type, you have a network which resemble the one I showed you for the CD4 T cells. And each of the edges are now inferred from the literature or actually from some of our scientists to tell us, I know there is an inhibitory effect there. And this is actually where we are going, trying to go towards much complicated, yet very tractable in this case, it's a delay type of sensitivity. So it's a skin test, which is most of the time used. So the model building workflow, as we have started doing, is that we're trying to get the, the available data. We model it into one type of formulas, in this case, the GLA and the OBEs, make an abstraction. And there is an abstraction level that needs to be done. It's not just trying to get whatever edge comes out of the literature and building up the model. There is a level of abstraction. Fit the model data, validate against the new data, make the prediction. And this is actually the one where you would think that is probably one of the steps that should be uh, quite interesting to, to get because that's where you want to have your model to be validated. This is the most difficult one, and the only way I could get around this to do the experiment, except get, getting myself into the lab, was to actually join one of the European grants, which is called the Enfin, to actually do the experimental side on some of the predictions. That's the only way I could get around getting someone interested to do the model. So in conclusion, what we have developed here is really a standardized methodology to, then, to generate the dynamical behavior of any cellular network. And the thing is that we tested that nowadays with several hand-drawn pathways that some of our scientists have. If they have just signaling cascade, that is no good to us. They have to have some kind of feedback loops in that network. But sometimes they know the feedback loops. They didn't write it, obviously, within the, the clock, but they know that feedback loops. And this approach is very useful when you have no or little quantitative data. And I know it's going to come that we will have quantitative data for every type of process. And it's only needing the network topology, which is actually a great advantage for us. And we extend that currently to the mouse cellular and hopefully to the animal model, but this is really in the early phase. Before the end, well, actually now, I'd like to thank mainly one contributor is now back at UNAM in Mexico. Is Luis Mendoza, who has been really instrumental in that. The advantage of having such a fellow in, in our company has been to actually open our eyes on an area which has not that much known. And I've seen that Denis Tretievki is actually giving a talk at the ISMB or a course at the ISMB. I would encourage a lot of you to go there because it's really an opening onto another area of actually dynamical, um, dynamical uh, modeling. The last people I'd like to thank is also a collaborator that I'll start working with, which are areas in the FPGA and the model checking at the EPFL, the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne, and the people from the Enfa uh, group at the FP6 with Nuremberg. And that's it for now. Thank you very much.
So, are there any questions for Yanis? Um, look, in building up your interaction maps from experimental data, do you um, weight uh, that data according to the quali perceived quality of the original experimental work at all? So, you mean, is, is are any of the edges being weighted so that you would that's say right, there are yeah. more influence from that? So, in the general logical analysis, no. And that actually comes to a corollary, which is how do you treat asynchronous signal? Because in this case, I only showed synchronous signal. I'm not saying that one signal is going to come earlier than the other. This is one way of treating the system that we didn't do. For the weights, if you know that one signal is more important than the other, the general logical analysis is not the, the way to go, but rather the ODE part. It's actually where you can add the weight, and that was one of these omega factors that we had in, uh, in the ODE. So that's where the, the, the weight on each of the edge, I mean, which type of flux is going through each of these, would be useful. Other questions? Let's thank Yanis once more.